Greetings and welcome, everybody, to this week's edition of Poly Weekly News. I'm your host, David Danto, and I have a co-host with me today. Uh, Katie Atwell Marizic is uh, is joining me. We're going to talk about um, uh, uh, lots of things going on this week. This is the show before we go to ISE, so we're going to be joined by uh, our, our friends from Wayne Research, and we're going to talk about that. And in fact, I also want to give you a bit, guys a bit of a head up, heads up that um, for our ISE show, we're not going to produce it on Monday. We're going to do it on Tuesday instead, because we will uh, be able to give you more wonderful content on Tuesday than we can on that Monday. So watch for us uh, Tuesday in the normal time slot uh, and not Monday. But in any case, Katie, let me ask you to introduce yourself, remind everybody uh, what you do here at Poly, and then introduce the team from Wayne House. Thank you so much, David. Hello, everyone. My pleasure to host today with David and the Wayne House team. Um, I am the lead of Poly Analyst Relations here, and um, we have two terrific guests, as David mentioned, a well-known industry analyst. Let me ask my guests to introduce themselves and give a preview of what Rain, Wayne House does. Craig? Oh, okay. I'll start off. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Craig Durr. Um, I, of course, we work for Wayne House Research. I'll, I'll give an overview of Wayne House very quickly. Wayne House is an analyst and research firm that focuses exclusively on enterprise communications. Uh, you can think of the devices, the services, and the technology that enable employee communications to take place, as well as collaboration. Uh, Dan and I, and I'll, Dan, I'll introduce stuff in a moment, cover a lot of group collaboration and, and spaces. I focus on room-based collaboration experiences, a lot having to do with video conferencing. Dan? Absolutely. Great to be with everybody here today. Uh, as a, another one of the senior analysts here at Wayne House, I cover some of the complementary areas from Craig uh, within the uh, meeting room devices and services. So large format touch displays, uh, wireless sharing and presentation solutions, and then visual collaboration software, both within the office and, and also uh, in hybrid locations. Um, and it, just to piggyback off of uh, Craig's thought process uh, around Wayne House, we really focus on being data-driven and uh, building out uh, off of our product expertise uh, that each one of us brings to the table uh, versus a little bit more of uh, the high-level uh, you know, um, takes that, that sometimes end up being out there. We're a little bit more under the hood and, and let us roll up and get dirty with it before we're, we're going to talk, uh, talk it through. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Dan. I had the pleasure of seeing all of us here actually recently at Enterprise Connect. First time in two years, all getting together. What was it like? What's it like returning to live conferences? How was your EC experience? It was great, actually. I, I have a funny story, but I'll tell you, let's, let's go to your, your first part of this question. We haven't seen each other as a group of analysts, as even as a group of friends for, what, two years it's been, right? Yep. David, I, I think I've seen more coming from your home office uh, and calls than I have in person. So it was fantastic to see everyone. So there was a couple of things that really uh, rose to the, the things. I mean, everyone was just so excited. I mean, the energy, like you could like taste it. It was in the air, like electricity. Um, and the second thing that was taking place too, is that companies were very excited to share where they've been and what they've been doing for the last two years. We, we've been following it and seeing it, but this was uh, some of the first petting zoos in a while, right? You guys had released products and we, and we haven't had a chance to see them or touch them or test them potentially. Uh, as well as the, the the end customers, as IT decision makers. So there was a lot of excitement around the showroom floor. I think a lot more than you might have expected in the past uh, since the people were there. I really enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I would have to agree. It was really exciting. Uh, the last time I was at DC, I was actually in a vendor role rather than in analyst role. So it was a little bit of a, a new experience for me uh, at EC this time around, sitting on the opposite side of the table. Uh, but it has it was a lot of excitement. There was. Um, I think even in the run-up to EC, everybody was, will everyone show up? Will everyone not show up? We'll see how it goes. And I think, uh, you know, by and large, the uh, feedback was that it was better than anybody expected. And it was just a, a great way to get back into the swing of things and kind of broke the ice. It feels like now everybody's very comfortable looking at all the different shows. I just came back from NAB in Vegas this week, and I've been seeing more and more invitations go out um, as the spring is going on, kind of showing that I think we're getting back to, uh, you know, in-person events being the way that we'll, we'll see things go forward. Yeah, Dan, it's interesting. I, I was at NAB as well this week, and, and, and a number of the vendors told me 
that, you know what, we're here, we're showing our products, we're showing our services, maybe we'll get a couple of leads, that's fine, but that's not really why we're here. We're, we're, we're here to see the people we know are coming that we haven't seen in a long time. And they, they were using that. And, and at Enterprise Connect, there were so many hugs going on. And, you know, I, I don't mind hugging somebody I've known for 10, 15, 20 years, but I was hugging strangers, you know, or people I barely knew. And what I realized afterwards is I wasn't so much hugging them as I was embracing the fact that I could be out with people again. I was hugging yeah. me. And, and it's really, it's, 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 a, it's a human nature kind of experiment. It, it really is. It, I'm an extrovert through and through, and uh, I'm somebody that loves to go out and talk to people. And when I left, granted, I didn't have a voice for a couple of days after EC, but <laughs> felt, it, it felt great to, to just connect with people and have those engaging conversations again. Uh, and to your point, I definitely gave more handshakes and hugs than, than I have in the last probably five years <laughs> over those two days. I, I'll give one other thing too. Both Dan and I also had a chance to attend Infocom prior to that. So the earlier version that took place in the year. And you can see the trend of more people showing up. Um, the, the key group right now that I'm really trying to keep a, a pulse on is those IT decision makers, IT buyers making these activities more part of their event. There, there weren't many in Infocom. They were present in, um, I, I think, at Enterprise Connect. Uh, I'm actually pretty optimistic what we're going to see when we go to ISC in Barcelona in terms of the end customer and those end customer experiences. All right. So, and, and I'm exactly the same way. You know, I reach out and shake people's hands and then offer them a Purell. That's just the only way you can do it at this point. Um, uh, some people take it, some don't. All right. So, so then I have to ask this question amongst the, the four of us. You know, we are all industry conference hounds you know, probably have been for years. We show up at a lot of these events because it's what we do for a living. Um, but if you've been to Infocom, if you're planning to go to the, the, the Infocom that's coming up in June in, in Las Vegas, if we just got back from NAB, if we were just in Enterprise Connect, why ISC? What's the significance of that show that makes it different from the others? Why are we schlepping all the way over to Barcelona um, uh, to, to, to attend a trade show? Uh, what, what, what do you think? What, what, why are you guys going? Daniel, you want to I, I, well, I can. And I, I think that is that's a softball question because that is so there's two things. Um, one, in terms of a holistic show of what's taking place in the audio video industry, ISC, I think, is world class premiere. There's probably only one or two that have that. But the other thing I think which is very important for me as an analyst is you cannot discount the influence of the European market, the EMEA market, on what takes place in the rest of the space. A lot of these conferences wind up being North America based, wind up being close to where you have many corporate headquarters in North America. But um, there's a lot of really interesting emerging trends around the EMEA marketplace that I'm keeping an eye on. And so seeing those customers understanding and watching them interact with the products is a key element taking place. I'll give you a quick example. Um, EMEA is one of the, uh, it's got very strong trends in terms of adoption of PC-based video room devices. Uh, it's been a strong market for the last year, and they seem to be continuing to have strong trends in that. So um, th there's great opportunity, and, and I'm expecting to see positive results from cloud service providers in that market continue to grow. The, the Zooms, the, the Teams, uh, Google Meets, things like that because they're continuing to, there's still a lot of adoption opportunity within that EMEA market right now, driving that space. And I would just piggyback off of that to say, you know, regionality as uh, has become even more important through COVID as everybody's numbers flux and that has completely shaped the trends on how folks are going back to work. So I think moving into the next year or so, having, you know, some connection and feet on the ground uh, at some of these shows that are a little bit more uh, out there, so to speak, like whether it's Barcelona or some of the ones that happen in London and things, I think is going to be important um, just because we are seeing trends emerge that are slightly nuanced depending on where your location is and what the overall regulatory environment is that, that you live in. So I do think that that's part of it for me. Uh, I will shamelessly say going to Barcelona for a little bit of time sounded like a, a you know a great way to, to spend some time in May. So I'll, I'll admit I was excited when Amsterdam said they were going to 
to Barcelona <laughs> and said, I'm definitely going to try to get to that. Um, but the other thing is that we're seeing a convergence of both the AV and the IT, but also between uh, the enterprise and consumer grade. And I don't mean consumer grade in the sense of like hardware, but experience wise. And we're seeing those things come closer and closer together. And ISC has one of the only shows where that you see run the gamut from the consumer grade, high end consumer grade, all the way over to the enterprise. And so I do think it's a very interesting mix that you're seeing and also an interesting place to start to um, see emerging trends of some of these European vendors that aren't going to step full fledged into, you know, coming to Infocom, but we'll start to dabble into some of the, th the things that will, you know, whether they merge or through acquisition end up coming into play in the next few years. We love hearing about all these trends. Um, one trend that Paul is super passionate about is the hybrid working and the urgency of firms needing to adopt the new ways of working to be successful. What is Wayne House's opinion of these current trends? They seem to be taking place. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just being lighthearted. I mean, hybrid work right now is uh, the love it, hate it word that you have in the marketplace right now, but it describes accurately what's taking place. Some people are evolving it to talk about flex working um, and, and, and it is an adoption. The, the, we've been doing a lot of research, doing a lot of interviews with uh, in decision makers, IT decision makers, line of business leaders, people responsible for teams of 10 or 20, trying to get them in and out of the office and trying to figure this out. And, and some of the key takeaways is that there's no single playbook that works across every company. Every company is a snowflake in terms of how they need to enact and do this. Now, if you take a step back, you can see some macro trends taking place based upon access to office space and things like this. So one example, um, North America seems to be going down the path of adopting what's called a 3-2-2 strategy. Three days in the office, two days at home, two days off. And people are kind of modifying that for the most part. Um, if you go to uh, Europe and, and uh, more specifically when you get to Asia Pacific as well too, you start having challenges of home space for working, for example, is something that really might change that model a little bit too. And so there's some nuances taking place. You also see too with uh, EMEA being a step ahead, if you will, of what's taking place in terms of COVID adoption and coming back uh, to the office place. They're actually, they, they're taking the brunt of the learning in many ways, trying to figure out how to get people back in the office and what it means. Um, so some of these, uh, Hybrid work is not going away. It is something, uh, David, you've always said this, work is not where you go, it's, it's what you do. And, and what we're seeing is people are now adapting their, their spatial relationship to work, where I'm doing my work. And it can be one of two, three, maybe even four places taking place. And, and it's, like, it's, it's, a, it's a Jenga puzzle. Everyone's gonna play it a little bit differently. The idea is how do you have um, technology that is adaptable to a strategy that is flexible. I, I know that's a lot of buzz terms, but hybrid work has to be a flexible strategy. There, there might be a new surge, the Omicron concerns might be coming up again or something like that, but the technology has to adapt, right? In, in, that, in that context. And the culture, the technology and the culture of the organization, because it's, it's, it, it's a lot easier, and I know companies don't necessarily look at it this way, but it's a lot easier to train a manager to more effectively manage a remote workforce than it is to bring an entire remote workforce back into an office all the time just because the manager doesn't know how to manage them remotely. Now, there are a lot of other factors at play as well, but the company culture is going to be one of, well, who's, who's managing? What are the supervisors? Right. And, and, and another one of the, the points, and I'd love to get your comments on this because I haven't seen a lot of research about this. We've tended in, in, uh, in, in North America and I think throughout the world to promote great performers to be managers. <laughs> even though even though performers aren't necessarily good managers, they're not necessarily right. bad ones, but it's different. It's a different skill set. And, and, you know, you train company employees on how to use the, the desktop applications and how to use the copy machine, but you don't really train them on how to be a manager. You just sort of hand it to them and say, go to town. So are we starting to see some of the cultures realize that they're going to need to adapt that, not just the technology? I would say that we're starting to see that happen. I, it, it's definitely going to be, a, I mean, that's a long-term shift overall, but the 
the idea that folks are having to rethink the workflow in general and also how my people are going to work, I think we're definitely starting to see that take root. And I, you know, some of the areas that I've seen in the research we've been doing this spring is around a little bit of the IT management understanding, hey, I need to provide certain infrastructure basics that I didn't need to provide before to enable the long-term uh, flexibility of the, the managing uh, teams. Uh, that I have underneath me. And so we're, we are starting to see some of that shift to say, all right, we'll probably always need to have the capability of someone dialing in remotely to certain meetings or having somebody be able to be not in the office because of scheduling or whatnot. But we're not yet to the point where I would say by and large management uh, teams are undertaking uh, active trainings on how do I best learn how to manage with hybrid tools. I, I don't think that I would say we're we're fully realized there yet, but we're starting to see those emerging uh, breadcrumbs to say, hey, we're, we're heading down that that path here. I, I think there is some regionality aspects here as well, too. So yeah. I, um, it, it's been a management philosophy for a while, management by objectives or MBO. We talked about something like that in the past. It's the idea that, David, here's what you need to accomplish for the week. Go get it done. Just make sure by Friday you have it done and you manage yourself to do that by that objective. Um, um, in some of the Western countries, the United States, UK, France, have been able to adopt that a little bit more readily. So MBO is something that's new. And having managers that know how to do this is part of that cultural challenge. Um, here's the regionality aspect. Um, there's still a lot of uh, deep-seated belief in some of the Asia-Pacific communities that work needs to be done in a seat in an office, that you work when you're butt sitting down in an office seat. You see that a lot uh, holding over in South Korea. You see a lot of that taking place in China uh, and some of these other uh, uh, culturally influenced workplaces as well, too. Now, now, there's modifications taking place. What you see is you see an increase in satellite offices taking place. So, for example, one of the largest rises and one of the most dense working real estate markets right now is Tokyo. Um, but what you're seeing is a rise in suburb office letting taking place, real estate uh, leasing taking place that's allowing people to be closer to where they live. Now, they're still going into a corporate seat, but they're now doing more of a hub and spoke model around corporate spaces as opposed to everyone coming to downtown Tokyo and into the central area. So um, you're right. There, there, there is, I, I'm kind of getting off the, the path. What I wanted to imply was the regionality. I think there is the challenge of cultural changes taking place. You'll see the US, you'll see UK, you'll see some of these Western oriented uh, countries adopting that management by objectives and trying to figure out those things. But you'll still, see, you'll still see some that are still going to try and work within their known paradox and just change the spaces orientation of, of how they're working. Thank you. Yeah, to piggyback off of that, um, what are you hearing about the great resignation from your research? What are people saying? Dan, you want to jump on that one or? Uh, I would say that a good portion of the research that we have seen has shown a change in, in that folks that feel they want to change or that they are reprioritizing what is important to them in the places that they work. Um, but I wouldn't say that we recognized a, um, a, a mass trend as of yet of saying, hey, everyone's moving from this type of a role to this type of role. There's no, I'm, everybody's quitting and only gonna go work for themselves. We haven't, I haven't seen any correlations exactly towards that, that end um, by and large, but I would say that people are reprioritizing what is most important and what is going to um, be their, their work-life balance moving forward. And if your company isn't a company that adheres to what those priorities are now, uh, folks are going to try pretty hard to look to find somebody uh, to align with that. And that's a couple different folds. It's about the fact that people moved out of cities over the last two years and became very comfortable where they are. Uh, anybody who lived in San Francisco prior to COVID and has moved out to anywhere else is like, uh, the cost of living where I am now is so much more affordable than where I was to move back to the office is it gonna be a pretty big shift. And so there's just a fair amount of folks saying, I, I wanna stay where I am. And if you're not the employer to do that, I'll, I'll take a peek at what else is out there. So we've definitely seen a shift in the amount of folks here in North America and in the and EMEA 
working for vendors that are not based in country for them um, and, and see a slight uptick on that. So I, I can say that I've seen that correlation, but I wouldn't say I've seen anything where I would say everyone's leaving IT to go to another industry or, or anything along those lines. Yeah, I, I'll piggyback off what he's saying. Um, uh, the, the There are two parts of this resignation. There truly are people who are leaving the workforce. Um, and there was two groups that, that that came up and some other statistics put together by Pew Research. One of them was baby boomers retiring early. I, this is crazy. I, I, I've got a huge nest egg. I'm going to go ahead and retire early. And, and thank you, sayonara. The, yeah. The other one that took place was parents. So in the time of COVID, when jobs became scarce, one of those areas was daycare and childcare. And so parents had to start doing this financial balance of do I stay at home and watch the kids and, and homeschool them? And then do I continue doing that or not? And that burden, unfortunately, fell on a lot of mothers. So there was actually a reduction of women in the workforce, according to Pew Research as well, too, in, in that time frame. Now, that other aspect took place of the resignation was what Dan said. People, employees got leverage. Employees said, hey, I am not, I, I can help make this decision now where I want to work. And so leverage using that leverage, they were able to make decisions about that. And you know what it's re resulted in is two things. It's resulted in a higher emphasis on corporate uh, entities having a higher focus on ESG type initiatives, environmental, social governance. These are the things that are the, the, the soft personality of the company and what becomes market to them. What does the company represent? How do they treat their employees? How do they treat the environment? Uh, these type of things became an important element as those employees had leverage to look into and understand what a company did as well too. And then something that ties it back to an area that's near and dear to all, all of us too, is you find um, certain things became a strategic asset in keeping employees. Uh, office space became a really interesting strategic aspect as people tried to keep hybrid work interesting and bring people into the office. And it wasn't about having extra pretzels in the snack room. It was about, do you have a compelling reason to come into the office? Did you earn the commute? Did you, did you uh, earn the reason for David to come into the office? And it's going to be things around, can he see our ESG strategy when he comes to the office? Can he understand what we're going about? Can he touch and feel products? Does he have the technology at hand to, to be productive and feel working? Uh, can you share in that joy that we talked about in the beginning of seeing people and, and getting the inspiration of physically being around my coworkers. Um, so that great resignation is just a cog in this wheel of everything changing. It's an important factor. And the key thing you take a step back is that employees are taking advantage of the leverage they've, they've gained in this marketplace. So, so, so Craig, I, I, I certainly appreciate your comments and I appreciate Dan's comments earlier about, you know, the beauty of the, of a place like Barcelona, even though when I go there for a conference like this, it's going to look like the inside of a hotel room, just like anywhere else, um, uh, unless you give ourselves extra room. But, but when we go and walk the halls there and look at some of the stands, is there going to be, in your opinion, and a little crystal ball stuff here, but is there going to be an, a, a, a realization that for organizations that do want employees to come back to the office, either full time or some of the time, that that office is forever changed based on our two year experience, that they can't just bring people back to the office and have management by walking around and have the same, you know, two conference rooms on the floor enable for video and all the other ones just have audio conferencing. And, you know, it, it, how much of an uptake or an understanding do you think there's going to be across manufacturers and across buyers that re that being in the office is going to require a new experience based on the way the culture has moved? Yeah. I would say that there is a, a, an understanding that yes, things have to change. From a very direct operational perspective of uh, during COVID, we saw a massive explosion of visual collaboration and other types of tools to bridge the gap of physical, uh, of physical space. Those are coming back to the office with us. Why? Because somebody's still working remotely, so I still need that tool to be a part of the stack I'm going to use. So just from an absolute, you know, basic uh, operational perspective, there has been a shift in how much video I'm going to need in my portfolio and how much of some of the other third party tools are going to be shown or collaborated uh, with within my meeting spaces or within my office. So I do think that we are seeing a shift there. Uh, the other aspect of it is, you know, and, and Craig and I have talked about this and, and seen this with some of the, the folks we've been talking to out there in the market, uh, is what does that new amount look like? And it really comes down to what are the work functions, what are the workflows that each department are going to have 
within your organization and backing into, okay, this room or these types of rooms are going to be used for these purposes and this structure of meeting and building those rooms to enable that. We're seeing um, you know, a good amount of, of uh, discussion around what happens when folks are in the room or are all in the, in the space and in the office and they wanna go to use uh, something and, and be able to share or interact with it. Uh, we're seeing you know, the adoption of digital signage and you know, digital sharing or, and um, presentation just within landing spaces and not necessarily being connected to video and audio outside because it's an open area or in a cafeteria and you get really, really bad experience from that, even with the best audio and video gear. So we're seeing a, an overall reset, I would say, of the understanding of what the investments need to be within the portfolio. And that we're seeing that really you know, rally around what are the workflows from end to end uh, within those spaces. Craig, anything else to add there? Yeah, Craig, I also I'll, I'll ask you to follow up on that with, you know, and I want to be very careful when I when I talk about the industry and I host these shows, I don't want to say anything that insults anyone, but we've spent two years sitting in our wherever we're working from getting a meeting invitation, clicking on it and having a conference and not really caring which of the 18 wonderful platforms that it happens to be on. And when people go back into using room systems, that today doesn't really exist unless you're using a third party source or unless you're uh, um, um, using PC based applications in the room. And it's not because it technically can't be done. It's because the platforms actually really don't want it to be done in many of the cases. That seems to me like a freight train heading for a brick wall, Craig. And I'd love to get your opinion on where you think that's going. Well, I, I don't know if the platforms are doing that. that that's a, a hard, but I do think it's this taking place. Um, uh, you've had this, this great training. Let's use the great term way too many times in this call. You had this great training. You had all these people that weren't used to video conferencing. Either they did, their department didn't use it or something like that, or their company didn't use it altogether. They were sent home, work from home. Everybody went home, and you know how they learned to do video? One head, one box, just like you're seeing right now. It's just me in the box, and I'm doing it more or less PC-based, right? Now we have people returning to the office, and now you've got three, four heads in one box talking to Katie, who's just one head, one box. And now you start dealing with this interesting challenge, which is equity. How do you make it an equitable situation for everyone in those rooms? And that's a technical challenge that a lot of people, you guys are doing a great job looking at this as well too. And it's, it's a key message I see you guys are putting out in the market as well. And, and what does that mean? Um, I, I probably overuse this analogy, but there's this great illustration that helps teach us to children. And it has a picture of a family standing in a baseball game behind the outfield fence. And they're trying to look over the fence and see what's taking place, right? Um, and they're trying to make the difference between equity in equality. So an equal solution in that scenario is they give all family members, all three of them, a box to stand on. And it's the same size box. But the problem is you got one tall kid, you got one short kid, one medium kid, and not all kids get to still see the baseball game over the, over the field. That is an equal solution given to everyone. And that's what a lot of IT administrators first gut reaction is. We're going to give everyone a webcam or, you know, whatever it is, they think that's a, a blank answer across the board. When you go to equity, what you're talking about then is giving a personalized solution so that people have access uh, equally in that context. So give the small kid a tall box. Give the, the tall kid a short box. Now everyone can see that game equally. And that's a great analogy for what's taking place, David, that you're talking about, which is how do you make sure everyone in that room who's now there has the same experience as one head, one box? I can see everything that you're doing right now. I can see your expressions, I can see what Katie is doing, I can see Dan, but if I was looking in on a room, for example, I may not get the nuances of what's taking place in the room. I may not have the individual pickup of the conversation or zooming in on who's actively speaking. So this is one of those challenges in going back in the hybrid work world is making solutions that are equitable that are, aren't burdensome on the end user. Is, is that yeah. kind of the, the way you were, you were trying to... Oh, oh absolutely. That? And, and you know, I, I appreciate the call out for the, the Polygear. We just the last week's show, we were talking specifically about director AI and the idea that, you know, uh, Dan, you and I just got back from NAB, that everything I learned in NAB, everything I learned in my settled production book, I now don't need to know because it's built into our cameras and endpoints. Um, it's actually kind of fantastic. But it's more than that because, and, and Craig, I definitely want to amplify what you're talking about, because it's going to be this in-room experience. Yeah. What is the the, what are the people coming back to the office going to experience in the room? 
and, and we believe here at Poly, and I personally believe that that experience needs to be elevated to support that equity and, and the equality. One thing is, you know, if you go into a room that has our systems in it, you're not going to see those old mechanical pan tilt zoom cameras moving around the room where everybody thinks there's some some spy, you know, looking at them in the room. You know, we're doing most of this now, and a lot of other organizations are going in that direction with EPTC cameras. So you yeah, don't yeah. see anything, you don't hear anything. It just kind of happens automatically. Two people start talking back and forth. You'll see a split screen. You'll see the cameras ease and move and do again what we learned to do in production schools. So I Correct. think we're going to have more of that. How do we make that in-room experience be something closer to what we experienced when we were at home? That personalized everything I need. Um, I can see everything. I can contribute. And how do we make sure that the remote people can equally see and contribute? And I know we've had this conversation before. If you remember every audio conference call you've ever been on where the people in the room say, okay, now be quiet. We need to hear from the people on the other end. That's just not an acceptable situation anymore. They have to be able to participate equally. So I, I think our company is far ahead in producing solutions like that, but it's a ramp that the entire industry is moving toward to try and build up those correct size boxes, as you pointed out. Yeah. You know, there was one other thing that that you you started, Dave, uh, on that um, triggered something for me, and then Craig kind of followed up there. But there's also been this idea of year over year, as different surveys have come out, folks are moving to uh, I want to just use my personal device every single room I walk into year over year. I believe two years ago there was a stat. I think it's out of Forrester, you'll have to double check me on this, where they uh, surveyed and it was about 54% of people were saying, I want to just use my my laptop device as my primary experience no matter where I go. And this year they did it again and it's up to like 74, 76% uh, of, uh, of folks saying that. And what, uh, you know, while we're talking about equity, and that comes back to how people learn and how people want to use something. So there needs to be this flexibility that, yeah, maybe I have a Teams room or I have a Zoom room, but realistically, I still need power to my laptop. So I need a USB-C connection and I want to just plug it in and have my device scale to the room because that's the easiest way for me to understand how to use it. Now, maybe somebody else comes in, they know how to use the Microsoft Teams room better than I do. So they leverage all that. Great. Not a problem. But there needs to be that accessibility and that, that uh, idea that at the end of the day, someone needs to have their, their most basic common denominator need recognized and realized when they walk in the room or you're going to get folks to say no 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 no, never mind i'm not happy i'm going to go back to my desk and just run the zoom call from there and then unfortunately you get the flip side of that which is if if i'm now coming back to the office with a, an hour and a half commute in and an hour and a half commute back and all i'm doing is taking zoom calls or teams calls on my notebook why did i go in and, yeah, and well that's earn the commute that's the earn the commute statement that's the one that's yeah. important Hey, there's an interesting dynamic. I, I don't, uh, the industry is trying to figure this out, but Dan, you, you kind of alluded to this a little bit, I think. Think back to a big room right now. And if we had six, seven, eight people in that room, think back to 2018, prior to the pandemic, if there was a video conferencing call. For the most part, everybody was in that room, was trained to look towards the front, towards that camera that was at the front of the room now. Flash forward now to 2021, 2022, when we had all these new users trained, and to Dan, you said they were trained, on their laptop. They're used to experience looking down at this and having my keyboard. Look at those same rooms now. There's an interesting behavior change taking place. You have more people looking at their laptop, even though there's a camera at the front of the room capturing information, maybe because something like Teams allows you to also see the content up close and personal, which solves a great problem. But it creates some interesting challenges for us as an industry to still think about. I still don't have maybe eye contact or maybe I, you know, the, there, there's a lot of really cool opportunities here to continue to enhance the situation is what I'm trying to, to do. And it has a lot to do with what Dan talked about. It's the evolution of how we've learned video conferencing in this case, or collaboration as, as Dan's an expert on in terms of, you know, sharing data, structured or unstructured data, for example. So um, we're evolving. Well, I think we're in an exciting time, which is kind of cool because um, the pot's been stirred. Dan, Craig, thank you so much for your time today. Such a fun conversation. It's always great to spend time with you. How do people find out more about Wayne House? And if anyone needs to get in touch with you, what can they do? Dan, what's good? All right. Well, first off, you can always check out waynehouse.com. Uh, anybody who is internal to Poly, also, uh, you guys have access to all of our research, I believe. Uh, everywhere that happens to be in the world. Uh, so uh, you can always reach out to us through our portal uh, or you can find us on social, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, 
And uh, of course, if you happen to be attending any of the uh, shows, whether it be uh, ISE, Infocom, uh, I might make a little quick trip out to Neocon uh, at some point because I've heard there's going to be some cool furniture going on out there. So uh, we'll, we'll see you uh, uh, hopefully on the road. But if not, please uh, find us, follow us, reach out and ask any questions. We're, we're always here to help. Yeah, there's nothing better than have a chance to talk to people on the road. So, David, to your point about happy to see people, stop by, ask a question. I mean, we're we're we're. We're like everyone else, work in the room, trying to learn and see what's going on. And half of the way we get to understand that is by talking to people and how they're understanding how they're using these technologies in their environment. All right, uh, uh, Dan and Craig, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, a couple of uh, uh, minder notes for the two of you and for everybody watching as well. So uh, the next week we will be in Barcelona. We will be at ISE. The show opens on Tuesday. So I'm not going to do a show on Monday. Um, I'll probably put a two two minute clip up saying why are you watching? I said I wasn't going to do a show, but you know it's always good to have those reminders <laughs> up there. Um, uh, the event opens up Tuesday, and Poly Weekly News will be live from Barcelona and uh, uh, on Tuesday at our normal times, uh, 10 a.m. in the uh, East Coast in the U.S. and uh, whatever that translates out to, I think 3 p.m. in the U.K. and 1400 GMT. Um, so please watch us then um, at ISC. We're going to be having a tweet up. Um, Dan and Craig, I hope the two of you will come by. To, to the poly tweet up at the poly stand. Um, if you're looking for any of that inf information on that, I'm going to put up a link where you can register for that tweet up. It's an AV Nation uh, uh, tweet up that uh, my friend Tim Albright is going to be managing and running and uh, we're co-sponsoring it at the poly stand. So please come by um, if you're in ISC and that's one place where you can meet me, where you can meet Dan and Craig. And, and, and as they both said, please reach out to us if you're going to be in Barcelona. Uh, we would absolutely love to see you there. Um, just send us a note, drop, drop us some information on social media, and we will uh, spend some time saying hello and uh, catching up on what's going on in the industry. Um, so uh, for Katie, for the team at Wayne House Research, for all of my colleagues at Poly, I'm David Danto. Thank you very much for watching this week, and we'll see you next week from Barcelona.